Hey Data Factory fans, this is Daniel Perlovsky here, and today I'm going to talk to you about how to create a fully generic, slowly changing dimension type 2 pattern using mapping data flows. Now, within mapping data flows, you are able to have both completely hardened schemas and completely generic flexible schemas. This idea of flexible schemas is something we call schema drift within the product. And we're going to utilize schema drift alongside with some new functions recently introduced to mapping data flows to really be able to build out this type 2 slowly changing dimension pattern with no metadata required at all. Now, for those of you that don't know what a slowly changing dimension is, a dimension table is really common when creating star schemas. And dimension tables contain relatively static data about entities that change slowly and rather unpredictably. Before we get started with our data flow, I want to give a quick overview of the data set we're using in today's demo. Using data acquired via basketballreference.com, I have a list of players along with a primary key ID column, their current team and current salary. Now, something to keep in mind with type two slowly change dimension is every single time we update a record, we don't overwrite or delete the old one. What we do is we'll take the existing record, mark it inactive with the active column being zero, update the active end time, and then add an additional row for the new value. So the way to think about it is if a value is existing and nothing changes, you do not edit the data set. If a value is net new, you add a new row. If you're updating an existing value, you update the existing row, mark it as inactive, add an active end time, and then add a new row with a new value with an active start time, an active value of one, and an active end time of null. Now let's take a look at the data we're going to be ingesting. Our incoming dimension data is going to be seven rows. Rows two through four are the ones with Steph Curry, Damian Lillard, and Zach Levine are going to actually be updates. So we're going to mark the existing rows as inactive and add new rows. Row five and six are the exact same as what currently exists in the dimension table. And row seven and eight are net new. So none of these primary keys exist in the table right now. Hopping back over to the data flow, let's take a look at sort of the logic used to do this completely generic SCD type 2. Now, the CSV file I'm ingesting via a completely generic delimited text data set. All I am doing is passing in a folder parameter and specifying that at runtime. Now, the dimension table, I'm also specifying at runtime. I just have a single parameter, no schema, and we're specifying which table we're reading and writing from as we're running the data flow. Going back to the data flow, as you can see, we're reading from this CSV data set with no schema whatsoever. We're reading from this SQL dimension table also with no schema whatsoever. Doing a quick data preview, You can see that our source data is as expected. We have a bunch of active columns in our dimension table. This should be very similar to what is in SS SSMS right now. Going into our CSV file, we're pointing this, just passing in the folder in our debug settings. So this should have those seven rows that were outlined earlier in this demonstration. As you could see, this has the seven rows that are located in that ADLS Gen 2 storage account. The first thing we want to do in our data flow is make a hash from the primary key and also the columns coming in. We'll be using these to do generic comparisons throughout this data flow. Uh, the ID hash, since we're only passing in one primary key, we're just using the by name function and then wrapping with the MD5 function. The Holmes cache is doing a completely new function called bynames. Now, bynames takes an array of strings and will return the column values of all of those strings. So in this example, we are splitting a delimited string coming in, 
passing into the bynames function, and then wrapping that around an MD5 function. You can look what our generic parameter setting is, which is just player team salary. So it is really just taking the, these three columns and creating a hash from that input. Now we're doing the same thing actually for our existing dimension table as well. So because the primary key and column names are going to be the same for both, we're really just creating identical columns in both. Something we're doing as well before is we're just filtering to only really look at active columns because we don't really care about inactive columns when updating our dimension table. After we create our hash input, we're going to use an exist transformation to verify that both the ID column coming in and the columns hash coming in are actually different from the existing dimension table. This is used to filter out incoming dimension rows that have the same exact values as what's in the existing dimension table. In this case, we do not want to update that dimension table. Going into the data preview, you could see now we're going from seven rows to five rows. Once the data preview returns, now we just have five rows with our updated rows and our new rows as well. Once we have just the rows we're inserting, we're going to then add a circuit key column to update the rows that we had and add that non-business key that's incrementing. Something that you might notice is that we generated our key from index one. Now, in our existing dimension table, that incrementing key has a maximum value, and we really just want to add that maximum value to our incoming dimension data. Now, there's a couple ways you could do this within Data Factory. What I'm doing is I'm just going to be using a cross join. What my cross join is going to be doing is it's going to be joining every single incoming row with a single aggregated surrogate key row generated from the existing dimension table data. Now, this is just a new branch from that add hash existing transformation that we created earlier. And it is an aggregate transformation with no group by columns and a single aggregate row that just is an aggregation of the max value of a key column. Now you could see we're using by name here because as I said earlier, every single thing in our metadata is completely drifted. After we join that aggregated circuit key, we're going to add all of our dimension columns to this incoming data. We're going to replace our existing key, which can increment it at one with the existing key plus the maximum circuit key. We're gonna mark this incoming row as active, have an active start time of current UTC, and have an active end time as null. Let's take a look at data preview to see what this returns. Now, after the data preview returns, we could see that we have our incoming drifted rows, which are completely generic, the hash columns, and now we have the incremented surrogate key with the correct value, these incoming rows marked as active, and the active start time and end time being correct. Now, when we're actually writing the data, we don't want columns such as ID hash, columns hash, maximum surrogate key. Here, I'm just doing rule-based mapping to remove those columns we added just for computation here. Now, the final thing that we're going to want to do is mark all of these rows as insert using an alter row transformation. As we're writing to a SQL database, we're going to mark our insert rows as insert so that those are added as new rows. And then our updated rows, which we're about to get to, we're going to then mark those as update and match those on the primary key value that you pass in as a parameter. Going back to our existing dimension data, we do need to mark these updated rows as updated and modify those values as such. So going back to our add hash existing, which is the last transformation we looked at, the first thing we want to do is see whether or not one of our existing rows is updated. So does this exist in the new and updated rows? And we're just matching on this ID hash that we're passing in. 
taking a look at the data preview to see what's actually returned by this. As expected, we have three existing rows that are updated in the new and updated rows stream. Now we have to mark these rows as inactive and give them an active end time. So going to our derived column, all we're doing is we're making that active uh, column zero and making active end time equal to the current UTC time. Now we want to then go into the alter row and mark these as updates. So let's take a look at these rows that we're going to update before everything. Now all of these rows are marked as updated, are inactive, and you could see have an active end time. Now, similar to what we did with the incoming data, we want to drop all of our unwanted data using rule-based mapping. And then finally, we're going to union all of our data using a union column. Let's take a look at this data that's about to be written to our sync. As you could see, we are writing five new rows, which are the new and updated rows, and then updating three rows. The updated rows all are inactive and the updated or new rows are all active with incrementing primary key, the active start time as the start of this run and an active end time as null. We're writing this back into that same generic sync that we're using as our source. And the only setting that we're doing is we're allowing inserting and updating based upon the primary key that we're passing in as a parameter. Now keep in mind, within this data flow, we're using no data specific columns. We're not using the ID column. We're not using the columns coming in. Those are all getting passed in as parameters. Now going out to the pipeline, let's actually run this. Now what we're doing is we have all of our data as pipeline parameters. So our generic input, we pass in the folder at runtime and we pass in the table name at runtime as well. Our data flow parameters are just going to be the primary key and the column names that we're passing in. So let's run this using the debug cluster that we've already turned on. Our incoming dimension data is located in a folder named MBA slash salary dim. Our dimension table is called dim MBA salary. Our primary key is the ID column and the column names we're using are player, team, and salary. Now, this is just the data that I'm using. Your data will obviously be different than that because this is supposed to be a completely generic model that could work with any different metadata. Let's click OK and run our pipeline. Opening up the active monitoring, it looks like everything has succeeded. You know, our data took some time to read, write, and transform, but going into our sync, we, as expected, wrote eight rows. And let's take a look at our destination data to verify that everything was written correctly. Rerunning the same SQL query. We can now see that our updated rows were updated and going down to the bottom here, now we have our brand new rows as expected. Hopefully this was helpful. Hopefully this was informational. If you have any questions, feel free to post them in the comments. This template will be available as generic slowly changing dimension type two in the ADF pipeline gallery. And feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at big underscore data underscore Dan, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you all.